There is a hope and a light that shines as we journey through this life. We find His peace inside from the one true God who came to die. Good morning and welcome to On the Road with Jesus. My name is Rody Fisher, and we're here live from Hope Radio. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Clint Gonzalez, for that wonderful lead-in song. I just love it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would search us, O Lord, and know our heart. Try us and know our thoughts. See if there's any wicked way about us, Lord, and lead us in the way of everlasting. We invite you here, Jesus. Run the show. Lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We are in Psalm 35. I have a special guest, and he was here yesterday, and kind of we decided to let him speak again because we only got halfway through. And so um, because of that, I did Psalm 35 yesterday. I'm going to be doing it today again. And so... um, We'll start, I'm going to use the NIV, and we'll start in verse 1. And, you know, this is David again, um, asking the Lord, pleading with the Lord, praying to the Lord, save me from my enemies. And, you know, we know about the fact that David spent 10 years running from Saul, hiding from him. And within those 10 years, there were several times that he he could have killed Saul. We know that. But he said, you know, he wasn't going to touch God's anointed. He believed that Saul was king, and I don't want to kill him. God put him there. I, you know, I don't want it to be on my hands that I killed Saul. And there was one time where Saul went into the cave that, that, um, David was in, and David could have killed him right then and there. He had a knife in his hand, and he even cut part of Saul's robe. I mean, how close must he have been? And he didn't. And then when Saul got down, he said, look, I've got your, you know, your robe here. Look, I cut that off. I could have killed you. I mean, talk about brazen, right? But Saul was after him. There was another time, I think, if I recall, that he um, took something of Saul's. He was at the camp, and he said to the general or the person in charge of watching Saul, you know, look at what I got. You know, I could have killed him, but I didn't. So he held back knowing that this man has been jealous, envious, didn't like him hated him, wanted him dead. He had plenty of time, I mean, a couple of chances to kill him, and he didn't. I feel really bad about this, Sean, but I put a cough drop in my mouth, and I have to take it out because it's annoying me (laughs) on the air. I feel like I'm going to spit it out, so I'm going to hide behind here, take it out of my mouth, and put it right there. I'll, I'll clean it up later. Sorry about that. Anyhow, getting back to David, he had a lot of enemies. It wasn't just Saul. I mean, let's face it, you know, he had other siblings, brothers. I know I had siblings. We fought. They weren't necessarily enemies, but his brothers didn't really care for him. Let's just put it that way. I know that my brothers and my sister and I fought as kids, arguments, maybe even as adults. But you know, we, we love each other. We've had times that we've been kind of struggling. And he had that with his brothers. I'm sure his brothers thought when he came to bring food to them or whatever with the giant being there, they thought, what is he doing here? And then when he offered to go out and slay the giant, they probably were thinking, now look at this kid. He's the smallest runt in the family, and 
who does he think he is? And then he tried to put on that big old, you know, Saul was king. Not to mention the fact that Saul was claimed, they claimed that he was the tallest man in the nation. So he was a big, tall guy. And here was David trying to put on his armor to fight the giant. And then he finally decided, no, I can't wear all this stuff. And he took his slingshot. And I, I'm sure if it were me, I'm sure his brothers thought, wait a minute, what is he doing? He's taking that slingshot. Come on. And so they probably were embarrassed, not to mention, you know, they didn't love him. Like, I mean, maybe they did, but they, they fought. They, you know, they put him out in the pasture. Let's leave him there. Um, and, you know, when, when they were thinking, when I forgot his name, they said, you know, I came because the Lord told me that one of your sons are going to be king and David was not on the list. He was not even on the short list. So, and not to mention his son wanted to take over the throne. And, you know, um, <clears throat> so we know that David had a lot of enemies, starting from a little, little boy. And so here he is again, pleading, praying, asking the Lord to protect him from his enemies. So it starts here with, I extol the Lord. Wait a minute, I'm in the wrong one. I knew that was, sorry. So we're reading 35. I'm sorry, I'm making such a mistake here. Okay, Lord, help me. Uh, we're in Psalm 35 and verse 1. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend, um, contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and buckler. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am, I am your salvation. Yeah, the Lord, he's declaring, the Lord is his salvation. May those who seek my life be disgraced and be put to shame. I mean, I don't know. Well, I'll tell Lewis this. I don't know that anybody's been after my life, like really to kill me, except for when we go to the mosque. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of talk there, but, you know, and we'll have to save that for another day. But, you know, people do hate you and you think, oh my gosh, they hate me up to killing me maybe. But anyhow, may those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. I love that. The angel of the Lord. I remember listening to um, David Wood. I'm not David Wood, but Jay Smith. And he said... You know, his angel protected him from death. You'll have to go back and look at that particular episode. <clears throat> with the angel of the Lord driving them away, may their path be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Since they hid their net f for me without cause, without cause dug a pit for me, may ruin overtake them by surprise. May the net they hid entangle them. May they fall into the pit to their ruin. Yeah, they are digging pits for us, hoping we fall in. And oftentimes they're the ones that fall in. When my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation, my whole being will exclaim, Who is like you, O Lord? You rescue the poor from those too strong for them, the poor and needy from those who rob them. Ruthless witness come forward. You know, P 
people come forward and speak lies about us. And, and we've all had that happen to us. But, you know, the Lord is our protector, our avenger. Okay, ruthless witnesses come forward. They question me on things I know nothing about. They repay me evil for good and leave my soul forlorn. Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. When my prayers returned to me unanswered, I went about mourning as though for a friend or a brother. I bowed my head in grief as though weeping for my mother. But when I stumbled, they gathered in glee. Attackers gathered against me when I was unaware. They slandered me without ceasing. Here it is, lies again. Like the ungodly, they maliciously mocked. They gnashed their teeth at me. Oh, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my life from their, f f rescue my life from their ravages, my precious life from these lions. I will give you thanks in the, in the great assembly, among throngs of people, I will praise you. Let not those gloat over me who are my enemies without cause. Let not those who hate me without reason maliciously wink the eye. They do not speak peacefully, but devise false accu accusations against me who live quietly in the land. You know, I, I have to just say this. I was thinking about this job that I had and this girl that had the same position I had he used to lie about me all the time. And there was just no way I could prove that she was lying. But in the end, the Lord came through and they figured it all out. But they gape at me and say, aha, uh -huh, aha, uh -huh. with their own eyes, we have seen it. Oh, Lord, you have seen this. Be not silent. Do not be far from me, O Lord. Awake and arise to my defense. Contend for me, my God and Lord. Vindicate me in your righteousness, O Lord, my God. Do not let them gloat over me. Wow. Do not let them think, aha, just what we wanted. Or say, we have swallowed him up. May all you, I'm sorry. May all who gloat over my distress be put to shame and confusion. May all those who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and disgrace. May those who delight in my, vindicate, in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May, may they all always say, the Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servant. My tongue will speak of your righteousness and all, the, all your praises all day long. Yeah, he was really, he was really in a bind and needed the Lord to rescue him again. And I think we've all been in some form of that one time or another. Um, I'm praying that doesn't happen to me again, but you know, if it does, I know where to go. Um, thank you, Lord, for your word. And we pray that you would give us understanding of your word and speak to us clearly about what you want to say through that ver that chapter, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I would like to today welcome my guests back. Um, you met him yesterday, Louis Lionheart. I am so grateful you're here. And if you remember yesterday's um, show, we talked about his testimony and things that he had been doing for the Lord. But we really didn't get to his main uh, ministry that the Lord has given him. And if you recall, I said that I met him because we were on our way to Pakistan and someone had told him about us and us about him. And he was te going to be teaching a class on Islam. And he called us and he said, can I practice on you guys since you're trying to figure out what Islam is all about? And we were so grateful God sent him. But welcome, Louis. Thank you. Welcome Pleasure back. To be here. Okay, so tell us a little bit about um, 
the ministries and your current ministry that God has placed on your heart um, after you accepted the Lord. Um, and we did hear a little bit about you um, sharing Christ and things like that, but let's start off with that big subject. Okay, and uh, that psalm that you read is very fitting because it applies to oh, wow. not only things I've experienced, but I, it's a common thing to oh. have people that are out preaching the gospel, having ministries be slandered, being attacked, having those that are opposed them sit back and wait for their fall, set snares for them. So there's Dig a pit for them. Yeah, there's a lot of experiences that uh, I can comment on that I've experienced in Santa Monica where, yeah, we've had a, a lot of uh, regular hecklers, we would call them. They would come regularly. Um, but that's a little bit later down the line to start about the ministry, how it started was, uh, again, as I began to open air preach on Third Street Promenade, that was at, uh, also something that I was doing at other places, but not regularly and not with equipment. I would go out and preach the gospel. I would go and do evangelism, hand out tracts. I would talk to people individually. Um, any chance I had, I would preach the gospel. The Great Commission, right? Right. Okay. So, And this is something that just comes naturally through the Spirit of God. It's not forced. Mm -hmm. um, if, if with the Spirit of God, He'll move you to those areas where He's calling you to. It might be something that you're nervous to do. It might be something that you don't feel adequate to do. But as God is moving you, He's the one that's going to provide. He's the one that's going to make the way, open the doors, and equip you for the purpose for which He has called you. So He's the one that you need to rely upon and not on yourselves. Yes. Yeah, so even uh, with David going against Goliath, oh, he was shorter, he didn't fit in the armor, and he went forth with a sling and a little pebble. Yes. And as uh, Robert Morris said one time, we see Goliath as this giant and David as this little man with the little pebble, but a small pebble tossed by the hand of God can level a giant. Amen. And that's what we need to focus on is that it is God and by his hand that we can let see these strongholds fall that mm -hmm. are against us. And so with that, I, you know, I would just go out and doing open air preaching was not an easy thing. Yeah. And, and uh, it still isn't. It's, you know, speaking in front of people uh, is considered one of the biggest phobias out there, apart from death. Yeah. <laughs> uh, public speaking. It's a big phobia. So getting up in front of a crowd and more so being heckled or being asked questions, being interrogated by the audience, it makes it that much more difficult. But you get used to certain things, other things you might struggle with, but you get through them and you rely upon the Lord. You know, as I would go towards Santa Monica, I'm in prayer. I'm asking for God's spirit to be upon me, to give me the words of wisdom, to put a hedge about me and about the ministry and those that are there and just relying on him. And no matter what you do, if God has called you to something, it's going to be fulfilled. We can try to chicken out of it. We can try to make yeah. excuses. But if God has called you to something, it's going to happen. And with my experience, it's 20 years later. <laughs> I'm still out there, even though at times I've tried to pull out. And in different ways, through different circumstances, God has brought me back to Third Street Promenade. And uh, I don't think I'm done there yet. I will go back. I've taken a short absence. Uh, one, the COVID. Um, I had some equipment issues. Um, those have been resolved, but now it's just waiting for the... Right timing. Right God's timing. timing is perfect. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, a lot of times we would set up and we would get set up the equipment and you would see uh, sometimes the equipment would fail and you would have those that would make fun of that, that would be glad. They would say, oh, see, God is punishing you for being out here. They would uh, make up all kinds of things to just make light of little issues as if that was a sign that I was doing something wrong. Yeah. I I, I want to interject one thing first. Tell us the name of, I know that you're talking about Third Street Promenade, mm -hmm. and eventually the Lord gives you a ministry and the name of the ministry. I just want you to put it out there because um, just so that the people know what your ministry is called. Uh, Truth Defenders. I love that. 
I knew that I, I could have said it for you, but I wanted you to be able to say it. Okay, so that's the name of your truth defenders. Yeah. Um, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. And he's saying, but through me, and that was him speaking. Okay, so take us back to the hecklers. You're you're setting, uh, oftentimes you're setting up equipment, and it's not an easy thing to be, A, knocking on doors, B, on like a little podium, out preaching, pe preaching the gospel to the lost, anybody that'll listen, especially when there are hecklers and they're there just to belittle you or knock you down, put you in that pit. So tell us about that. Well, there would be times where throughout the years, we've had different groups of people. Uh, we've seen the change in the times. And uh, Charles Spurgeon said very clearly, he said, preach to the times. So we, you know, the culture changes, the mindsets change, different ideas come about. And you need to know where people are at so that you can speak to them in the times where they're at and not preach, for instance, a Spurgeon sermon in a time and a culture that doesn't apply. Right. So although much of what Charles Spurgeon preached, who was the prince of, prince of preachers, is applicable, Right. we need to take what he said but apply it accordingly to the times and to the people. Uh, likewise with Scripture. Scripture is universal. It's for all times and all places. But we need to take the context in which we preach it so that we're not taking the Word of God and misapplying it. So with that, we would get different people that would come, young students from college. Uh, at one time, we had like 15 different college students that would come with lawn chairs to set up and wait for me to set up my equipment and watch the heckling and at times heckle me. And this happened for a few months where they would come regularly. And I'm thinking, you guys have to have something better to do with your lives as young students than to come out here and heckle a preacher. They're yeah. like, no, this is fantastic. They liked it. Um, some of them would hear the word and receive it. Others wouldn't. Uh -huh. But it was uh, it was just something pretty amazing to watch, that they would take their time to bring their lawn chairs and set up in the street in a public forum just to watch a preacher um, debate and ask uh, questions and have questions asked of him. Because I would set up a microphone for Q&A. Uh -huh. And this came about through Robert Morey's ministry, who... Uh, in his Monday night Bible studies, he would set up a microphone after his sermon and he would allow everybody to come down and ask him questions. And nothing was forbidden. You could ask him anything on any subject and he was willing to answer. Well, you know, I, I want to just add this. Um, school kids, school students are really kind of used to a Q&A because they're interested they're they're wanting to trick the teacher. They want to ask that tough question, and they're curious. So there's a lot of reasons that they do that um, at schools. Um, and and you know, there's people that are on the debate teams, and they they challenge people like you because they want to sharpen their their tools of debating. And so I could see these young people coming down there. But but that has to sharpen your answers. You've got to be sh sharp on all things. So, you know, the Bible says, by, the, it doesn't say in the Bible, God doesn't say to us, um, okay, I want you to read the Bible every day. But he does say study, study the Bible, study the word, study and show yourself approved. He wants us digging in the Word of God, sharp, iron sharpening iron, being with others that have been in the Word of God themselves, and come, let us reason together, the Bible says. So he wants our tools, our, our sword to be sharpened so that when you're standing there on that soapbox with your microphone there so that all could hear on Third Street Promenade, or wherever you set up, um, that you can kind of take the blows. You have to be sharp enough to have an answer um, for these for these lost people. And so, yeah, you're yeah. 
doing exactly you said something like um you know you have to kind of, you didn't say know your audience but that's what you know know who you're talking to but these students they're used to these q and a's so yeah um the verse that says to meditate upon the word of god mm -hmm. it's not an eastern meditation yeah. where you just blank out and you clear your you, mind right it's actually to contemplate to meditate upon the word of god by reading it understanding it contemplating it coming to know what the meaning the context and that's what's going to give you the tool the right application mm -hmm. when you use it yeah yeah and that's uh, and we would get not only college students adult grown men young men and women and all walks of life, mm -hmm. all cultures, because Third Street Promenade is one of the biggest tourist attractions in California. And there are thousands upon thousands of people that walk that Third Street uh, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And on the weekends, hundreds of thousands. And so it would just attract an audience. The microphone was there. And like I said, with Robert Morey, he was like that he invited questions because he did as a young man as a young christian have questions and yeah. he was actually from his testimony was kicked out of a church for the sin of asking questions wow and he was very uh depressed over that he wasn't getting answers until he did come across walter martin uh, who wrote the book kingdom of the cults yeah and he said ask any question you want and this his eyes opened up and he was just blessed that somebody had answers for him and so that, he modeled his ministry after that. And then me being under Robert Morey, this has been an influence in my life where I'm saying, ask any questions you want. And we do have the answers. Right. Biblically, we can answer any question in life that pertains to life and godliness, directly or indirectly. The answers are there. God, exactly. Yeah. I want to point something out. You mentioned Robert Morey. I mean, not you did mention Robert Morey. I, I had been... Uh, down in Irvine when he was down there too um, and he, he did the Q&A's but I also wanted to mention Walter Martin who's now passed away mm -hmm. as well and gosh you know when I first came to know Christ he was doing a you know his book had just come out and he was doing a class at at Melody, Melody Land. And so I would go to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and this is in the early 70s. They were out of the church and in the tent. And um, and then after, go to Walter Martin's class at Melody Land. And, th and then he got to be on the radio and stuff like that. It was a wonderful, um, wonderful man. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the Bible answer man. <laughs> yes, right. yes. Yeah, so with that, we, we can answer these questions. Uh, the Bible says to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Exactly. So we do have... Thanks the, for finishing that. I, <laughs> <laughs> so we have the word of truth. We have God's word. And in my ministry, I came up, uh, didn't come up with, but I had certain verses that I would apply as part of the ministry because I see these as a calling for every Christian. Mm -hmm. Although... We are not all called to the same capacity, to the same things. We all have the same calling as Christians, which is to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world. Exactly. So in different ways, however God has called you, maybe not directly to be the one preaching, but to come under that person and support them in their preaching of the gospel. We're all part of the body. So mm -hmm. we're all essential. We're all needed in different ways, in different capacities. And although God has gifted everyone differently, we all have the gifts of the Spirit that are clearly laid out in Scripture. Love, kindness, generosity, all these different gifts of helps, just to a different capacity. Um, I might not have the gift of, for instance, let's say giving to the capacity that somebody else does. So I might give but not as much as somebody else that just gives so freely that they're sacrificial in it. Not everyone does that. Not everyone has the gift of preaching, but everybody ought to preach. So we seek the Lord to just increase in us those gifts and to use them for his glory in wherever he has called us to. So we don't have to be so hard on ourselves into thinking, well, I'm not Charles Spurgeon. Right. 
Right. You know, and so, you, well, we're not Charles Spurgeon, but we are called to preach. Right. And we can use what Charles Spurgeon has laid as a foundation in his ministry to springboard off of that. And we can do that with in every area of life. We're all called, like I said, to different areas of ministry. But we have to find out where God has gifted us. And the church, those around us, will see those gifts in us and will encourage us in that. And we have to be encouraging. One of the gifts of the Spirit is to be encouraging. We need to encourage others in their gifts so that they might apply them more. Sometimes we don't see things in ourselves that others see. And so right. we call we acknowledge that we call it out and we we support it and that's how ministries are, are built up and so third street promenade i one of the verses that i apply is first corinthians 1 17 through 18 where it tells us to preach the gospel so we are to go out and preach the gospel uh also in first corinthians 15 1 through 8 we have the gospel defined we have to know what it is that the gospel message is we like to maybe say, well, just preach love, just preach Jesus. But the gospel is all-inclusive with love, with the person of Jesus Christ, in that we preach his life, death, burial, and resurrection. That is the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. We are to present that message that God sent his son, born of the virgin, was crucified for our sins, buried, and risen on the third day. This is the saving grace of God. That's that the good news. That's the good news. So through that, people come to salvation, putting their trust, their faith in him, in that sacrifice, ex receiving that saving message. So once we do that, we also, well, we're to go forth. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, God says to go forth. So we go forth with this gospel message. It all comes together. We also are called to give to every man an answer, as we were just speaking about uh -huh. in 1 Peter three fifteen, We are also called to cast down thoughts, imaginations, first in ourselves. The Bible says, take every thought captive and make it subject to the authority of Christ's word. So whenever we have a thought that is contrary to scripture, we stop it in its tracks. We hold it captive and we submit it to the authority of Christ's word. And we test it. Uh -huh. And if it's not in accord with God's teachings, we set it aside. We're all going to have thoughts. We're all going to have different world views that we were brought up in and sometimes these things are going to cross our minds we don't have to condemn ourselves just take those thoughts captive and make them subject to the authority of god's word yeah i, I think a lot of us have cultural upbringings that um we all know and some of them are not really of god like right. it's just a cultural thing or and let me just say cultural myths and and habits that we do right. um, aside from th thoughts that just kind of come into our head and we know that the enemy likes to put thoughts in our heads so right well Robert Murray would say you can't keep the birds from landing but you can keep them from building a nest exactly <laughs> I like that so when yeah. those thoughts arise just shoo them away yeah don't, don't let them fester and we just that's how we renew our mind that's how we continually are washed by the word of God Exactly. That's yeah. why it's so important to stay in the Word. Exactly. And then we're also uh, to it, we're exhorted to contend for the faith. A lot mm -hmm. of times we think we just present the gospel and leave it at that. No, we, we need to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered unto the saints. And that is in Jude 3. Mm -hmm. We're also called to put on the armor of God. And this is first and foremost. So before all these things, we put on the armor of God. Now, I left that for last because I just wanted to get these positions out there. But before we do all these things, before we go out and preach the gospel, before we contend for the faith, before we go out and uh, engage the world, we have to be armed with the full armor of God. And this is the most essential thing. We can't go out in our own strength. We are not contending against flesh and blood. These are spiritual matters. The sword of God is his word. We are to put on the full armor from head to toe. Go forth in the power of his might. By his right hand we are delivered. Not by our own strength, not by our numbers, not by wisdom of words, but by the gospel of Jesus Christ, his truth. I want to say a couple of things about what you're saying. Number one, um, let's go to that scripture about the full armor of God. 
Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Okay, so it'll take me a second to get there. Um, But Ephesians 6. um, So why don't you go ahead and read that whole... Do you you have the scripture there or do you want me to read it? I have it here if you want me to. Okay, so we're in Ephesians 6. So I'm going to use your highlighter, Mm -hmm. okay? So... um, Ephesians 6, the full armor of God. Are you starting with uh, verse 10? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I already have it uh, underlined, but um, I'm going to highlight it as well. So go ahead and and read from 10 to, uh, where are you going to go to? Uh, To 20. To 20, okay. So go ahead and start from the beginning. Okay, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the in the evil day. And having done all, to stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and on your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and with the, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me the utter- that utterance may be given unto me, and that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And that is Ephesians six ten through 20 concerning the armor of God. Wow. So I kind of want to point out one thing about this full armor of God, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but for some of you who have not heard it, um, God is wanting us to, from head to toe, have our armor, and we've got a sword and a shield too, so we're we're ready for battle. Exactly. Now, it's kind of interesting that the Lord doesn't say, now once you've got the armor on, I want you to take down your enemy and kill him or whatever. But I find it interesting that he's saying continually through this, I want you to take your stand against the enemy. I want you to stand your ground and in everything to stand. Stand firm with the be- with your with the belt of truth and buckled around your waist. And then it says, and the and the sword of the spirit, which is the, you know, the word of God, pray in the spirit in all occasions with all of your prayer requests. So he's telling us to get ready, but stand. Who's gonna fight our battle for us? The Lord. The Lord. We just have to be ready fully armored. Now, the other thing I find interesting about this, so we're prepared for our battle. We've got it, everything on, our full armor, but he's not going to say, okay, jump on that guy, wrestle him to the ground. Right. It's not against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood. We're, we're to stand on his word, stand on what he's, you know, stand, stand. Right. Against... um the demon schemes and all of that. So we're just to stand now that we've got all this full armor on. We've read the word. We've studied, showed us self-approved to God, all of that. So now we're to stand. I also find it interesting that when you think about, when you think about an armor, putting on an armor, and it's really speaking to the sign of the times of that day, where in the world did they put armors on? You know, they they went to battle with armors to fight, you know, like 
let's let's say, take the story of David. And he was trying to get this armor on that was way too big for him. It was Saul's armor to fight this giant. Well, he was outdoors, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you get your armor on, you don't just sit back in your castle and say, okay, I'm set. I got my armor on. Let me relax here. Right. You're, you got to get out of the castle. You got to go across the moat. You got to get on some ground there. You might even jump on a horse and get to the enemy, which is at Third Street Promenade. The battlefield. The battlefield. I, you know, I'm going to just say this, and maybe I'm speaking to myself too. You know, we Christians have studied under some really good teachers over the years. I mean, I loved Pastor Wilkerson at, at Melody Land. Our, our, I loved Pastor Chuck at, at, um, at Calvary Chapel, um, Costa Mesa. I loved hearing Greg Laurie Monday nights at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And then moving over to Calvary Chapel, Anaheim, and listening to Pastor Mark and Pastor Louie and Pastor Rich. I mean, I loved, and today you can get online and listen to a whole litany of pastors and teachers because some of the teachers are not pastors. And well, we can just sit at the trough, I'm just saying it that way, and feed ourselves to death, like getting fat on his word. And unfortunately, and I'm speaking to me too, some of us are just you know, at every Monday night service, at every Wednesday night service, I know when I first accepted the Lord, I went to study every single day during the day when my kids are in school so that I could learn about what God was, you know. But we're all called to this great commission. And as we've gotten so fat, people, me too, on the word of God, it wasn't just for us. It was for everybody out there, the loss. And today is the day. I mean, our time is so short. If we haven't figured it out yet, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back quickly. And we need to be putting up our own soapbox and standing on it. Even if it's just for one loved one or one neighbor or something. Because we have been studying the word. I know Christians that, you know, if I told them I was sick, they could tell me five scriptures right there about in their prayer for me to get well. And I love that about Christians that have memorized the word. But we need to share the word with the lost. Yeah, a lot of times we don't think we're ready, but we'll never be ready. That's the Never. thing. And I love so, the way it happened with you. Tell us tell us again what happened. Well, Somebody didn't show up or something. Yeah, the open air preacher that was there uh, went to get some coffee, hot chocolate actually. And um, there was an audience ready to hear the message. And they turned to me and just handed me the microphone and said, go ahead. <laughs> and it was very difficult. But I got up on the soapbox and I went ahead and preached the gospel and invited Q&A. And it was difficult, but I did it. And I did it again and did it again. And it did get easier, but it's I'm never trusting in myself. No matter yes. how much I've studied, no matter how much I've learned about worldviews, the way people answer, it's always trusting in the Lord because I don't have a formula. There's no formula or, or key to how you answer a person because it's an individual. 
I've always seen everybody as an individual, even if they're from the same philosophy or religion or culture or worldview. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's influenced them throughout their life and why they're coming up with certain questions. They might have the same question as another person, but the reason for why they're asking it might be different. So my answer is going to affect them differently. Mm-hmm. So I want to listen to them, and I would invite people for, to, uh, I would have a sign on my microphone for the audience for intelligent questions and comments, no arguing. I don't want to argue with people. Mm-hmm. I want to have a discussion. And this is what I would try to calm people down. I would never try to quench their emotions because I understand these are emotional arguments. So if they're yelling, if they're getting emotional, I don't let that be a distraction. I understand these are emotional mm-hmm. subjects. These are worldviews that can affect their lives, their eternity. So I would just invite for Q&A in a rational, uh, intelligent way. No, that's really good. I'm sorry I distracted you because you were on a roll here. I forgot to bring my water, and I think I'm going to start coughing. But anyhow, I I wanted you to um, talk about that, about how you how you got past that, and and how the the ministry formed. Yeah, well, it was me and a group of friends that were there helping the main preacher and as we would take the equipment home we are the ones that would set it up uh we figured hey why don't we come out on a day that he's not here we have the equipment we can do some open air preaching ourselves and so little by little we started coming out regularly apart from the friday night that we would set up for the main speaker we would come out on saturdays and then sometimes on sundays and so that's how that started developing we had some regular people that would come by and and help and take turns open air preaching. And this is where we eventually decided we need to come up with a name and we'll Thank you. go ahead and brainstorm. So we all got together, we were brainstorming. And like I said in our previous interview, uh, it was off of Robert Morey's Faith Defenders name. I, we came up oh. with Truth Defenders. I love that. So that's how that arose. And being out in San, and on 3rd Street, it's... It's just an amazing time because, I mean, we've had, I've had eggs smashed on my head. I've had milkshakes thrown on me, hot coffee. The most common thing that gets thrown at me, though, is coins because they're so available. Someone will just read. Yeah, well, people reach in their pocket and they'll throw something at you to distract you. Okay. Um, We've had uh, equipment damaged. We've had our share of death threats. Um, So it's been a roller coaster. But we don't let any of that deter us. We've had water balloons from third-story buildings coming at weird angles. <laughs> and um, it, it's just been its been a blast. It's been a good time. And again, because it's not against flesh and blood, right? we've never let those things distract us. We just move on. If something gets broken, it gets replaced. If I get eggs smashed on my head, you make an omelet. So right. that's how you have to take it. Um, the death threats may come. They may not. It's not something we look forward to. It's not something we want to boast about. But they're real. There mm-hmm. are people whose worldviews are so shaken that it leads them to acts of violence. Mm-hmm. But that didn't deter Paul. He went out and he preached the gospel unto his own hurt and continued to come back to those same areas. Not everybody's called to that level, but those who are, we need to encourage them and support them so that they may continue in their calling. Now, let me just say this. Don't you think that's one of the lies that the enemy will whisper in people's ears? That, you know, they shouldn't talk to their friend about Christ. They shouldn't talk to their mother about Christ. You don't want to get them mad. You certainly don't want to be knocking on doors. You don't know who's behind the door. Or stand on a soapbox and you know in a public place where some stranger could kill you so isn't I know for me um, it was it was really different but <clears throat> I mean when the Lord heals you of cancer and you know you're dying and then you take make a u-turn and God heals you I felt compelled beyond my own strength to talk to everybody about what God did for me, like the you know, like the Samaritan woman that ran and said, "Look, come and follow me," and 
I'm going to point you to the man that told me all about me or the blind man that couldn't wait to tell people about him seeing um, or the leper. So I know that for some people that were brought up in a Christian home and have known Christ, you know, as a child and grew up that way, possibly, I don't want to categorize people, but there are people that, you know, say, well, I wasn't called to preach. Um, but that thought of getting hurt, their feelings hurt, maybe they're, you know, get somebody mad at them, or even, like you say, up to death, um, and only certain people may be called to that. But we're all called to share the gospel, are we not? Absolutely. And we have to be ready in season and out of season. Yeah. And so, um, how do you answer? How do you answer the average Christian that that says, you know, I'm not a preacher. I, you know, I don't share the gospel. I, I just let my light shine for Jesus. Well, the Bible is very clear that we're to go forth and that we are to engage people. If you're, you don't have the confidence to go out on your own, team up with somebody. Look to somebody that's already doing that. That's a good idea, yeah. And come alongside them. And you never know when the Lord's timing is going to be for you to be the one that does the preaching, that does the engaging. And you're going to learn. We are to be equipped. Uh, the purpose for the pastors and teachers are to equip the saints for the ministry of the gospel. Right. They watch over our souls. They feed us meat. They feed us the word of God. They, they strengthen us. They encourage us. And so you get under a pastor, get under somebody that has the experience and learn from them. Be and encourage them to them. And you'll be surprised how through that God's going to be building you up. And so don't just think that you need to go out on your own. And we see the example that they went out by twos. Right. So partner up with somebody. Call your friends. Talk to your church leaders. See what your church is already doing. If they already have a ministry, an outreach ministry, uh -huh. come alongside them. Ask them how you can help. How can you be a help to them? And then you'll see. And then, like I said, God will highlight your gifts that he's given you. And the church will see them. And the church will encourage you. Churches should be encouraging. They should be nurturing. It right. should be a place where you're growing, where you're uh, continuing to exercise your gifts. And that's what uh, somebody should do. You know, I do know that, you know, I, I, I attend Calvary Chapel on uh, Chino Hills, and they have a call ministry, um, which teaches you how to share the gospel. And I'm positive that, you know, um, you could find something, if not at your church, another another really good church that may have this ministry in place. And, you know, you can call there and see if you can join their class. And they've got classes going year round for, you know, sharing the gospel. And I do know that um, Pastor George Saig in he, he trains people all the time, um, trains just the average person into how to, you know, share with Muslims. And he's very specific about that, about how to, you know, share with Muslims. But also, um, you, need to, you need to be solid in your own faith. You're, you're defending your own faith. You need to know what it is you really believe. And I think that that some people that maybe are not really strong in their own faith may have a problem defending their faith. So there's a lot of things that, okay, go ahead. Right. No, well, I, I concur with you. We do need to know what it is we believe and why we believe it. Yeah. And I think you've said that. And it's because when we're presenting the message, if we ourselves are not saved or don't know that we are saved, how can we preach that and give encouragement to others? And also, if you haven't read this book, um, you don't know everything that's in it. And you, you, this is one book that the Lord wants us to stay in, and it's a constant read. And 
I know for me, I think, I had it, yeah, I, how did I miss that? You know, every time, every time you go through it. Right. Yeah, it's inexhaustible. Um, again, I quote Robert Morey only because he had such an influence on me, but he was a, a brilliant teacher. And he said, you know, the Bible is such that, uh, like a puddle that a child can play in it, but an elephant can drown in it. it the question is, how deep do you want to go? Mm-hmm. And he would always make the sound of a submarine diving, and he'd go, dive, dive, and he'd say, we need to dive deep. And he would say, when you come to my Bible studies, bring your Bible and your brain. We, this is Christianity is an intelligent religion. It is not just emotional. We need to learn and understand. Yeah, you know, I, I, I know that at the beginning, there was a lot of things that I didn't know. And the, the more I studied, the more, uh, you know, the, the better I got at it. And to, <clears throat> when somebody would ask me a question that I didn't know, I would call my mom and then I she'd point me to the Bible and she she would always say well Rhody did you go to the Bible and did you go to God did you pray about it and did you get into the word and I go they're asking me this and that and and that those were the two things she'd say to me well did you pray and did you get into the word and eventually it kind of comes together and we're still studying and we're still learning Listen, I want to thank you for joining us again, um, and we'll pray for your ministry. Love that ministry, and um, <clears throat> and I would like to talk to the person out there that has not ever made a commitment to the Lord. I, I'm looking at my Bible, and it's so beat up. I, I'm kind of embarrassed about this one, but anyhow, I, I'd like to speak to those of you that are out there that have never accepted the Lord and you feel that the Lord is calling you and you would like to make a commitment to Jesus right now. You heard Lewis say that Jesus died on the cross for you. On the third day he rose again. That tomb is empty in Israel. He rose from the dead. He died for you. Thousands of people saw him walking after he was buried and can attest to the fact that they saw him. Aren't you the guy? He had nail prints in his hands and feet and the scars from the thorn of crowns. And, I mean... And and the hole in his side. They attest to the fact that they saw him. And on the 40th day, he rose bodily to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. That's the kind of God we serve. He's alive today for you and me. If you would like to accept Jesus as your Savior now, I would implore you to follow me and mean it. You're going to turn from the life that you're leading away from that, of all those sinful things, and you're going to go on the path that Jesus has for you. Follow me in this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent from everything that I've done and said and thought in my past, in my present, and my future sins. Wipe my heart clean of everything I've done against you. Come into my heart and lead and guide me for the rest of my days for eternity. I love you, Lord. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer and mean it, Give us a call here at Hope Radio or go to our website at www.ontheroadwithjesus and email me and let me know. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Louis, for joining us. And we will be here t- every Tuesday and Wednesday from 11 to 12 on the road with Jesus. God bless you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. As we journey through this-